Hi everybody, thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is the, the second of a series of three webinars that 365 Aviation is hosting. Uh, last night we was last week we were speaking about the workplace and how that might change in the the future post pandemic environment that we're living in. Um, this week we are going to touch on travel, how the uh, what will the future of travel look like. We're going to think about how are we going to travel, how are we going to get there, what are we going to do when we get there, and where are we going to stay. A um, couple of uh, small points before we introduce the panelists. Um, there's a couple of functions on there. There's a chat function, which is just a general function you guys can uh, exchange thoughts on. And there's the Q&A button. If, if, if you hit the Q&A button, um, we'll try and get to those questions maybe during the, during the webinar, uh, or probably we'll save 15 minutes at the end there, and uh, we'll post a few questions to the panelists. Um, so moving along, um, I've got two panelists with me this week. Uh, we've got Michael Bonsall of the Rosewood Hotel in uh, in London. He's the managing director there. He's a veteran of the hospitality industry. I think he's been through uh, the Pierre uh, Four Seasons in New York, and of course, iconic carriages in in London. I think uh, Michael opened the Rosewood in London three years ago. Haven't been there, but a, a beautiful property. So we'll get his insight from a from a hotel and hospitality perspective. Uh, also, we've got Jimmy Carroll with us from Polaris Polaris X. Um, Jimmy's got quite an interesting background. He had a fairly distinguished military career. Um, then he moved on to, I believe, at Winch Design. He did a bit of, bit of work with super yachts, with, with private jets, something close to our hearts. Um, then he did some expedition leading and planning. I believe you, you planned the expedition to Mount Everest, the big, biggest ever medical expedition then. What is it called? Extreme Everest 2? Correct. Um, and about three years ago, you co-founded uh, Polaris X which is an interesting travel company. It's uh, experiential travel aimed at the luxury sector. And uh, they arrange incredible, you know, highly bespoke uh, travel to very interesting destinations. Uh, lastly, definitely not least, um, I'd like to introduce Arishad Salamat of Bloomberg TV here in Hong Kong. I get to see him every morning. Uh, he hosts the, the morning show here. I think he's been with Bloomberg 10 years, I think, in, in Hong Kong, and I think longer than that. And he's... Uh, Got quite a few scalps under his belt. I've felt some of the politicians he's uh, interviewed have been Bill Clinton, um, British prime ministers such as Tony Blair, uh, Gordon Brown, uh, I believe the former uh, Uber CEO, Travis Kenlick. Um, he will be moderating this evening for us. So, um, Rish, let me hand over to you. All right, thank you very much, Colin. And I'd like to just begin with Jimmy, Michael, Colin just laying out where they think we're going to be in the post-COVID world. And let's start off with you, Jimmy. How will travel change in your view? I think for us, we're certainly going to see a change in how our, our clientele really look at travel. And I think there'll be a big concentration on domestic travel. And that's been talked about and lauded a lot across the travel industry. Um, but certainly there's, there's a lot of unknowns right now to international travel um, and exactly the restrictions that apply to the clients, um, the domestic markets. And that's, you know, certainly for us in the UK, but that's for our clientele are fully international. And many of them haven't explored their own domestic markets hugely. Um, so that, that's certainly a big area. But then moving as we go into more international travel, um, and then our clientele very much using the services of 365 Aviation um, and those kind of facilities will allow them to, to get to places far more easily away from the crowds. And that exactly fits with the Polaris model anyway, which you know, we're very much about building uh, remote camps, luxury setups, being more in the wilderness, using yachts uh, to travel. So I think we'll certainly see a shift in a, in, a, in a spike in demand for that. And that's certainly coming through in the last couple of weeks. Um, and we're, we're seeing that from the American market, but also the European market as restrictions start to ease. Nice plug for 365 there, Jimmy. Uh, Michael, let's, uh, let's hear from you. Yeah, I mean, for us, I mean, we're really taking this opportunity to look at just resetting and, and really looking at reopening. Um, you know, we've been open seven years in London, but, you know, this is kind of back to day one. And when is day one? When is that reopening? Um, you know, I think that's getting pushed further and further out, especially with the, you know, the mention of, 
of a quarantine going into place? How long does that last for? And where do, where do these quarantines and legal restrictions exist in other countries and cities as well and the movement of that? So I think, you know, uh, yes, geographically, we need to reevaluate where our customer is going to come from in London, uh, which is domestic, um, and potentially France or Ireland, if the quarantine's still in place, whilst we reopen. So how do we talk to those clients? But also, I think for cities, it's even more critical to um, really understand what the client's looking for, because I think a lot of us are going to be looking at going into the country, going into rural locations, um, whether it's you know with Jimmy's company or to villa rentals or private homes, um, you know we're already seeing that at our resort in Cabo. Villa rentals are right up. Um, people are looking at flying in private into Cabo, um, off the plane, right into the car. Immigration's in the car, driven straight to the villa at Las, at Las Ventanas or you know in Tuscany or our villas there. I think it's going to be more difficult for us in the city to be um, you know, painting that picture of safety, um, you know, being, in the right, uh, being in the right environment and really selling um, that city experience. Um, and that's where we're looking at our product now in the city and how that translates into what the consumer will, will, will want coming out of this. Uh, yeah, I agree with Jimmy that I think that the green shoots of travel are, are going to be domestic, they're going to be staycations. Um, Obviously, in the aviation business, we're, we're primarily focused on uh, on international travel, not so much in the US because you've got a lot of internal travel there. But certainly for the international market, uh, there will be demand. Obviously, people will want to travel, um, but I think everyone's going to uh, going to have to face the fact that it's going to be more difficult. I mean, it, it, it seems hard to believe that there won't be longer queues at airports. There won't be more uh, checks to go through, health checks, etc. Um, we can talk about it later, but it, there seems every chance that there'll be you know, health passports, if you like. So it's, it's going to be more difficult. Um, it's probably going to be more expensive because a lot of those costs will be passed on. So my, my feeling is that we'll probably see potentially people traveling, uh, traveling less, less number of times per year, but quite possibly traveling for longer periods of time. I mean, that, that, I think the, the notion of sort of flying somewhere for the weekend, for example, is it, probably going to be less appealing. Um, and I think we're also going to look at the, the difference between the business community and, and leisure travel. I mean, for leisure travel, I suspect that's going to come back a little bit more slowly. Um, and some people will be nervous. But for business travelers, uh, even though we're using things like Zoom and the rest of the world is, has kind of worked out that they can communicate uh, without physically meeting. I think, I think physical meetings, especially initially, are still crucially important. Uh, and especially deal closings, uh, deal openings as well. Often you want to meet a lot of people. So I think that the business community will be under some pressure to fly. Um, and of course, safety will, will, will be coming to the fore there. I think that it will be a lot less about how comfortable an aircraft is, and it will be about how safe that aircraft is and how safe that entire journey is from the moment you leave your house to getting to that destination. Uh, so it's going to be more complicated for sure. I mean, you can throw out a lot of predictions that the world has changed entirely. We're going to have people not traveling at all but there's certainly I, I, I don't know if you agree with this uh, the three of you whether there's going to be certain behavioral changes a societal behavioral changes even if you will and that's something that travel and tourism's got to somehow adapt to so how do you actually adapt to that it's I suppose ultimately and Michael for you first uh, health will be embedded everywhere that's uh, something which is given for the time being at least yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and obviously at our level of the industry in, in luxury establishments, you know, health, safety has always been paramount, but even more so now. And I think the theatrics of cleaning will have to come out front. Um, and, you know, people want to feel reassured. People will almost want to, you know, know when, you know, areas of the hotel were cleaned or what, or what we are using in our cleaning as well. We're actually looking at all new systems from you know, ele electrostatic cleaners, fogging of areas. I mean, all of those practices um, are key um, to reassuring the public and the client that they're going to be in you know, the safest um, environment. Um, and we also want to keep our associates um, you know, safe in their environment too. So, um, yeah, and I think a lot of those activities and actions that we always did uh, now you need to be brought to the forefront uh, for reassurance. Um, 
And, um, you know, and that's why, you know, a lot of time right now is going into training um, and, um, and putting together um, really, a, you know, a very complete manual and sending it out to clients because we're seeing a lot of companies, a lot of, um, a lot of our finance companies and a lot of other companies that book our, our property looking for that reassurance now for travel at the, at the end of the year. How do you do it? How do you build confidence? And how do you have confidence in your clientele as well, Michael? Yeah, I mean, we've been, I mean, we've probably reached out personally, individually to about 800, I would say, uh, end clients and uh, companies that utilize uh, the hotel. Everyone's super eager to come back. I mean, the luxury market are definitely looking to book something, get something in the diary, something to look forward to. They're all super eager to travel when they can. Um, you know, and so really on personal phone calls, on email and so forth, we're, we're making those reassurances that these measures are gonna be right in place right from the get-go. Um, and they wanna travel, they wanna get back on the plane and they wanna come and see us as soon as they can. Colin, again, it's about your clientele and assurances. I mean, we have a World uh, uh, Economic Forum initiative known as, known as the KTDI, the Known Traveler Digital Identity. It started off well before this, but it starts to encompass health as well. And do you think there should be a universal platform? Uh, absolutely. I think one of the biggest short-term problems we're going to face is that, you know, even the airline industry and, and travel, air travel is regulated by a variety of different bodies. And let's be honest, at the moment, uh, we, we're really facing a political situation. Uh, the blame game's you know, going around in circles. We need to move through that. We definitely need the, the regulators at, the country, at country level as well to actually get together, agree international principles, international guidelines. Um, and you mentioned things, uh, technology, basically. You know, you're, you're right. There's, there are quite a few... There's quite a few trends in the industry anyway. If you think about you know, biometric data at airports, it's not that uncommon now. You'll go through there. It, it could be something, it could just be like in Hong Kong, we come through, we've got our own ID card, we don't interact with someone. Heathrow has um, iris scanning, etc. I think those trends are going to accelerate to reduce touch points in airports. Um, health passports, immunization passports. Again, these aren't that uncommon. I mean, certain countries might require you to have a yellow fever vaccination, for example. We're fairly used to that. Uh, that's definitely going to be expanded, and I think it's crucially important that we have global bodies um, very quickly pulling people into line and agreeing on international principles. So I think in the short term, what you might have is you might have, I forget what the Hong Kong government called it, I think they called it a travel bubble. You know, they may well open a travel bubble between, say, Macau, Hong Kong, maybe Guangzhou area by saying, you know, we think that you uh, have got a low enough level of infection that we're happy with and your control measures are good enough, you can travel freely between those areas. However, there might be other countries that, you know, are, are deemed not to be so safe. Uh, but 100%, I think the technology is going to be very, very important. And of course, various countries are trialing these, um, uh, these oh, tracking apps, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I can see that being extended into health passports, uh, wherever you travel to, and, and maybe even getting, you know, a, a green, a, an amber, a, a red sort of permission to, to travel. Jimmy, with your business, you already have, I suppose, small groups. You've already got almost natural social distancing. How does it impact you? I think there's, there's a number of different dynamics here. We're very lucky that our strength actually plays on our Geordie and I's military background mm -hmm. and we've taken the military planning model and overlaid that into a, a travel planning model. Um, and what that means, it leaves no stone left unturned um, and it's meticulous in its level and a lot of that, the foundations and you know, what people don't want to get stuck into, the, the boring stuff because actually everyone wants to the glory and the magic on top of the experience but it's about the health and safety and the security of all of our clients um, and actually I was running a trip in the Solomon Islands um, and Papua New Guinea in January and the, the Solomon Islands suddenly introduced on a very short notice two weeks notice that um, you had to have a measles uh, vaccination and show proof on arrival in country and the clients I was with were already traveling they've been traveling for four months 
but through our planning process, we had already built them up to become fully vaccinated um, and worked with them on that. So then they had an international vaccine card. And I think you're exactly right, Michael and Colin, we're, we're seeing more and more of that um, and the health passports. But in terms of Polaris and, and building what we do, it's, it's really looking at you know, how the client wants to live their lifestyle. Um, and I think we will consider that even more now, um, really what makes them tick uh, and what they still want to achieve. And we can still achieve a lot. Um, you know, previously, we've been to very populated areas, but we've managed to get private events at Petro and things like that. It, it's finding the ways to work with authorities and different bodies uh, and not necessarily everyone in travel. It could be government officials to charities, et cetera. So there are ways around it. And I think you're just gonna see more of that um, and we're well placed to deliver on it. Um, an interesting point from Colin about the flying. And I think the big lesson after 9-11 is that all the countries very much went about their own method of how they were going to police and marshal um, air travel. And they all had different systems. One was say you take a laptop out of a bag, one was say you could leave it in, you know, different measures, etc. I think through this um, pandemic, it, from that lesson, we've got to learn that actually we need to pull together as a global authority. So travelers, we make it easier for travelers uh, and they know that when they're coming in from one country, if they're leaving, they're having a check, they're, they're showing proof of inoculation or whatever that method may be. And when they arrive at a country, that they're not suddenly blindsided by another check which they're meant to have. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the strength for us is that working with you know, someone like us, um, we will do all those checks for, for the client, but there's nothing worse than arriving in, in, the, in the country after a long haul flight or whatever it is to then be told what you did in the last country doesn't work here and we've got to do it this way. I think so there's definitely got to be uniformity there. Mm. Even, think, even within think, countries as well. well I was like, even within countries, I mean, we very recently, we, we had to fly, fly someone into London, or into mm. the UK, but London area. And we were absolutely gobsmacked at the different information we were getting from different airports around London. Yeah. And you wouldn't have thought that would happen. So, I mean, it, it just goes to show that even at a, at a country level, there can be uh, maybe a lack of leadership, a lack of, of clear communication, and, and sometimes people at ground level just making their own decisions. Um, so that really just highlights just how difficult it can be. Um, I'm going to put this question to Jimmy again because it's sort of in your direction. We've got a, one question saying, do you think people are going to take more extended periods of travel or holiday, if you will, because of the restrictions and because of just the sheer hassle of, of actually getting out and going on holiday in the first place? And added to that, does that mean, and this must be a boon for you, would be, does travel then have to become more meaningful? <laughs> Well, naturally, I think everyone should be traveling all the time. And I think Michael will agree with me on that anyway. But uh, no, the realistic nature. I, I think the, 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 the crux of the question is actually around meaningful travel. Um, and we've become so accustomed previously that actually on a Thursday night, you could book a flight and Friday evening, you'll go for a weekend here. Uh, and that is wonderful. And I'd, I'd, I'd still love to be able to get back to that. You pop down to Tuscany or wherever for a bit of sunshine. But I think people really will want to travel with purpose more um, and, and have you know, a greater sense of experience of where they're going and real understanding of, of what they're doing. Um, people that we're speaking to in our clients certainly feel for the, the indigenous populations in the areas that we're going to, how the impact must be on them, because ultimately travel is a huge revenue generator for so many countries uh, and areas around the world. So, and also feeding back in. Um, so we do a lot of work into the conservation world. Um, clients actually wanting to have a purposeful element to their to their trip, be that from collaring the first elephant in you know, the the Zambezi Delta to um, tagging hammerhead sharks in the Galapagos. Um, and we're certainly seeing a rise of that. And I was speaking with the global head of philanthropy at UBS Warburg. And they're seeing a shift of people 
no longer just wanting to write a check and send it to a charity body. Actually, where's that money going? How can I go and have a positive effect and actually see it and be involved and have a lasting legacy in that as well? And so very much through our foundation, we work with entities on that front. But I, I yeah, people traveling more, I think, yeah, they probably look at actually how long am I going for? Let's make the most of this time. And maybe that's the change of a major shift in that, they only do one large trip a year, you know, and, and that's it, rather than lots of multiple smaller trips. Um, I think time will tell on that one. Um, I think on average, most of our trips are probably two weeks. The American market's slightly less because of their constraints on, on time. But again, the Americans were speaking to saying, actually, let's, let's go to the other side of the world, make the time and effort to get there and make the most of it. So. I think it would be certainly very interesting times moving forward. Michael, your take on this, and we've got a question from Maggie Drake asking about how will business travel be affected? You know, she's spoken to 20 CEOs, I'm just reading her question, 20 top CEOs, and they've all said that business travel will suffer because they don't want somebody to get stuck there, uh, right. stuck wherever they are. Now, that's one thing. But I mean, yourselves, it depends on your client base. How do you position yourself with that in mind, you could also have a boon for all this with what Jimmy just said as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we've, um, we've been talking to a lot of our business suppliers. I mean, um, a great deal of our business is from uh, the business community globally. Um, and we do a lot of events as well, a lot of conferences during the course of the year too. It is go all gonna change. It is gonna be an incredibly slow start once we open. Um, you know, we're already working with partners. Um, you know, if you're not flying in private, if you're flying into, you know, Heathrow or Gatwick, that you're, you can utilize services there, such as, you know, Heathrow VIP or Signature Class as well to get through airports um, and not, you know, um, and not be um, around other passengers, just getting off the plane as safely as possible into the car and out to the airport. Um, so we're making sure that our suppliers know that. Um, that our suppliers know about the social distancing measures that were taking place in the event space as well. Um, so that, you know, hopefully if, you know, the business travelers, you know, hopefully are coming off of Zoom and coming back to face-to-face -to -face and are traveling, um, that we're keeping them updated with our health and safety, the legislations of the country and how our partners, of whether it's private tra travel or commercial travel, can support getting their people into the hotel as safely as possible. Um, and we're very lucky at the hotel in London that there's a lot of great food and beverage in the hotel, great restaurants, great bars, um, big open spaces, outdoor space as well. So the hotel actually caters really well um, to maybe the new world that we're going into. Um, but it will be about um, really having that from arrival to departure, what does that business travel look like? and reassuring our partners that you can do that in London safely. Michael, can I just quickly jump in with uh, what you're just saying, because it goes to a question uh, from one of the attendees, Basil Lockton, asking about luxury hospitality. What are your expectations in terms of ADR, as well as luxury hotels, because you're all going to be after the same yeah. business. Uh, and I actually I have to confess, I don't know what ADR means. Yeah, it's the average daily uh, room rate. Now, you know, in, luck, in the luxury market in London, there's about uh, 30 of us in total who have really said to each other, we made a little promise that we're not going to get into a big price war. Um, but we have seen that already in cities like Hong Kong. We've seen some of the world's best hotels on sort of, uh, sort of um, you know, very, uh, at very attractive rates, um, sort of attracting consumers. Um, in London, I really hope we don't do that. Occupancy is going to be scarce. Um, I really feel that most luxury properties will be open, you know, from se se September onwards, um, despite hospitality being open sort of from July 4th. I think we're going to see the major hotels opening from sort of September onwards. And we are going to be in single digit occupancy. Um, you know, so really, I think, you know, that room rate needs to stay strong. Um, I you would, would say that though, wouldn't you? Sorry? You would say that. I would say that, yes. Um, and then by the end of the year, I mean, what I hope is that from a food and beverage perspective, you know, the bars and restaurants, 
potentially get back to maybe 60, 70% of what we saw last year business wise. Um, you know, and, uh, and maybe by December we're in the sort of 40%, 50% occupancy in the hotel, but I don't really see getting our 2018, early 2019 numbers back for another 12 to 18 months at least. Now, Colin, this, we've had a few questions about how perhaps uh, people will change the habits because of the environment. Let's face it, I mean, the baby boomers who, who kicked off with backpacking, etc., and in their retirement, they've been uh, traveling the world, exploring. They, the baby boomers may be locked down for a bit longer, may not want to travel as much, and I'd be fearful of exposing themselves uh, to this virus. Now, that would bring the youth more to the fore, and with that comes the youth demands for environmentally friendly ways of travel. Uh, uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? It's a, it's a good point. I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it, 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 it seems very logical that that demographic of people traveling is going to shift and the average age will become lower. Um, certainly that, that young group of 18 to 35 year olds who are, who are at less risk from, from COVID, for example, logically would be the first people to travel. And of course, there are people at higher risk and, and, and more elderly people be more reluctant so you're absolutely right it would be interesting to see the difference they make and maybe the the, the different requirements that they would place um, on whether it be us supplying you know, aviation services or a hotel or, or traveling to a uh, you know a remote tribe or a, 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 a sort of a, maybe a third world country where they actually care about the locals um, I certainly hope it will have that, that kind of impact and it will, it will get pushed a little bit hard, hard on the sustainability side of things. Yeah. And Jimmy, I think you pretty much have a fairly neutral carbon footprint, don't you, with what you do? Yeah, that's a big initiative. We launched at the beginning of the year with the World Land Trust that every single one of our trips is carbon neutral. So, um, and that's very much much at the, the ethos and everything that we, we do at Glorus now. I think we should ultimately, we'll probably see a much bigger shift in that um, across the industry, especially as people realize the benefits of the lockdown. You know, there have been some benefits and that's mainly for um, the ecosystems out there. And you look at the pictures of the Himalayas that you can now see from, from Delhi. So, Hopefully we can act on that and, and put in a, more of a carbon tax or you know, a cost in there. Um, we haven't had a client who has um, pushed back against our carbon offset and, and, and the cost of that at all. It's actually very reasonable and they've all believed that it's something that everyone should be doing. Michael, I mean, we've got several questions uh, from the attendees about how will you manage housekeeping? How many times will you be washing sheets more etc not just to protect uh, the guests but also of course the yeah. people who work in that hotel too and that has an environmental impact uh, naturally but what steps do you, do you take because there have been many many questions on this yeah and of course you know and this is part of um, you know we're going to be issuing a lot of these um, you know pre-arrival you know what are the, the expectations of a guest arriving I think it's gonna be really important to be communicating with guests ahead of the stay to understand um, you know, what we've put in place and what they may expect so that there's no sort of confusion upon arrival. Um, so for, as far as the bedroom goes, um, you know, uh, we're gonna be offering, um, uh, we're gonna be tailoring a lot of stays. So do you want turned down? Do you want staff members in your room um, you know, more times than, less times than perhaps you would normally have at a luxury property? You know, do you want your items tidied in the room during turndown uh, or not? Um, you know, the rooms, um, because of decreased occupancies as well, probably won't be an issue in, initially, but we're not going to reserve rooms back to back. So if a room is occupied, 48 hours later, it will not be occupied again. And then it will be occupied. So you're reducing risk on everything you do. You know, just, just back to the sustainability point, I really hope we don't go this way, but everyone's sort of um, solution to making things safer is to now wrap everything in plastic and sort of, you know, and tag everything and so forth. And I really hope that we're finding solutions in the business. 
But also, is, Michael, you, you've got to, and according to well, one question here, which is that you've got to have brand consistency across all the yeah. Rosewood hotels, haven't you? Yeah. And I think this is where, you know, Rosewood has an advantage and a number of other hotel groups too, um, that, you know, have strong Asian connections that we're, we're also learning from our hotel that's now open in Hong Kong and, you know, what they've been doing. So there's an incredibly... Um, detailed um, manual that we're working from that's already in practice in Hong Kong, Guangzhou, Bangkok, um, uh, Beijing, um, and we're learning from that as well. But it's going to be a lot about communication ahead of the stay. Um, and, um, you know, we're going to, all those high touch points as well in the hotel, elevator buttons, door handles, all of that, um, you know, the cleaning frequency on that is sort of every, you know, five to 10 minutes in those sort of high touch areas. Colin, I just want to get back to you because uh, quite a few questions about how do you work together with brokers, et cetera. Does that change the way you do it in the private charter business? How does, it is high end. It is, of course, one where you have, again, distancing taking place naturally. You've got groups taking uh, aircraft together would know each other work together etc you know how does it change the game post covid this question from uh, w james says you know the predicting a predicting a 20 percent shortfall in terms of rebound of traveling passenger numbers it could be much more than that how can you all work together to collectively make measures work here for you yeah i mean um Obviously, it's something you were talking about earlier about all the London airports having different regimes. Correct. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the business aviation of the spectrum, I, I think you know, the, the tail is not going to wag the dog. So, primarily, will be probably led by the by the commercial aircraft regulators. Um, I, I think I, it's it's interesting. Even in the short term, we're seeing a lot. We're, we're having to gauge the feedback coming from clients, and certainly their priorities are changing you know the, of course you would never normally get asked about uh you know what, how, when, when an aircraft has been cleaned for example of course those kind of questions are popping up um i think again it comes back to to procedures even down to the crew for example you know our crew having covid tests before arrival we're having it two days before arrival are having temperature checks our passengers having temperature checks um there's a whole host of things that at the moment, at the moment, there's not very clear leadership, to be very honest. And, and to be honest, even us as 365 Aviation, because of that, you know, we have to take some leadership ourselves and say, look, you know, we're collating the, the feedback we're getting from clients and the operators who operate the aircraft. You know, and we need to ask those questions ourselves of the, of the aircraft operators. You know, exactly how are you cleaning that aircraft? You know, are you using fogging techniques? Are you using the you know, ultraviolet light cleaners, for example? Um, so it, the truth is, it, it's it's a very very fluid situation. It's it's almost evolving on a daily basis, um, and to be honest, I, in many ways, I think it, it could be a positive. I mean, let's face it, COVID is not the only infectious disease out there. You know, a, a lot of people die of the the co they call it the common flu, but it kills hundreds of thousands of people every year. Um, so in many ways, I think we should probably embrace these things and, and not see them as potentially a a forced reaction to a terrible crisis and maybe just being a wake-up call that you know actually we're, we, we live with these viruses and bacteria every day um, we've got a lot of technology again out there that can help us with this and it maybe it's just a time to actually um, embrace it and you're, you're absolutely right it's, it's just super important that we can try and get common standards across uh, across regulatory bodies Thousands of jobs lost. I mean, we're talking about at least one estimate here from, again, a uh, uh, body here based in Switzerland saying that there are going to be a hundred, up to 100 million travel and tourism jobs potentially lost and five to seven years of industry growth perhaps put to one side. Those are frightening statistics. Uh, how do you deal with that, Michael? Because you're at the epicenter, essentially, because Jimmy, for instance, is dealing with high end, a different type of travel, Colin as well, Michael. Yeah, I mean, it's there's incredibly difficult times ahead. And I actually think when we start to reopen the businesses, those are going to be the tough times, actually, in many ways right now. It's quite a controlled environment, how we're operating, whether it's through government support or private support. But once we reopen, and because it's going to be a staggered reopening, you know, we're not going to open the hotel with all services, maybe one restaurant, two restaurants, then the bar, 
um, than the event space or whatever that is. So it's really, um, from a business perspective, um, you know, we want to safeguard, obviously, our associates first, and we want to deliver the best service to our clients. So any unnecessary expenses, any unnecessary sort of capital projects we had, all those lovely things we wanted to put in place this year, all going to get pushed out, I would imagine, until sort of end of 21 into 22, um, so that, you know, we can really take care of our associates and guests, first of all, is the main priority. But there are some very difficult times ahead, um, 100%. Um, and, um, you know, I really do hope um, that through therapies and potentially a vaccination at some point that we have that moment where things, you know, change and take a more upward, um, you know, cycle. There's going to be a massive shakeout everywhere, isn't it? Uh, Jimmy, yeah. perhaps you're immune. I don't know. What are your bookings like? What are your forward bookings like uh, looking perhaps to 2021? Do you have any? What's it currently? What's your current position? Yeah, I think yeah, we're not immune at all. It, it doesn't matter what level you're at. Um, the immediate effect was a complete stop of all in, inquiries. Um, I think that was, that was natural. Um, the trips that we already had planned, and there was a num quite a lot of those already, um, the majority of which we've managed to be able to postpone and push back to the end of this year. And actually quite a lot of them, people just taking and the relationship with the clients actually going, you know what, let's just put it on hold for a whole year, move it across. It was a good time of year to go, so let's just shift it by year. And then there's the cancellations, and we've been fortunate that we've been able to refund everyone uh, 100% on those. <clears throat> but in terms of inquiries now, yep, they are picking up again. Um, as I said, last week we had a number from the US uh, and quite a lot from, from Europe, which is great to see. People, and that's split into two categories. People want to go now, or where can I go now, or in the next month or two? And that's the hardest, and the now is the hardest. It's harder than saying August or September, because you know, and if you think about the UK, the, the quarantine period of 14 days isn't actually in yet when you can fly back in. But will it happen when I go away? And you know, I don't have a crystal ball to see that one. Um, so that's, that's the hard point there. But then actually a lot of our trips are taking a lot of planning anyway. So now is the time to start thinking about 21 uh, and what to do. So if it's a yacht expedition in Antarctica, we're, we're looking at a six month planning process. So January next year is a perfect time to be thinking about that now. But also a lot of our trips are multi-generational or prestige events as well. Um, we've had a lot of uptake in the honeymoons um, as people have, had to shift their weddings from this year. And actually they're saying, right, let's completely really reevaluate uh, and look at what we want to gain. We've had a year of kind of being sat back in the domestic market. Hopefully next year we can get away and we actually make something really big of this. So that has been an interesting part of the, part of the market for us, definitely. Um, a plane just went overhead, actually. It's not often, they're normally cargo. Uh, that brings us to another point, and I, I don't know which one of you would like to answer this question. It is, it's a very difficult one. And which airlines will survive the pandemic? How would it affect budget airlines? How would it affect uh, the normal standard, uh, I, I suppose, flag carriers as well? Uh, I don't know who wants to answer that. Either uh, Three of you, which one? Michael, Jimmy, Colin? I, I, I guess I, I should be sticking on, Colin. Colin should probably go first. I'm, I'm certainly not going to start naming airlines, um, but I, I, I think it, it's inevitable. I mean, some airlines clearly are not going to make their way through this. Uh, they're, they're very asset heavy. They, they've got very big fixed costs. Um, and <laughs> being very honest, there's a lot of them carrying debt out there, not all of which they probably needed. So I, I think it will become a balance sheet game. I think the, the, the companies that have got cleaner balance sheets and maybe have the ability to go out and, and raise funds uh, will probably make it through. The ones that were already fairly leveraged up um, sadly won't. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is what it is. I mean, the, obviously, commercial air, air flights at the moment are down 90 plus percent globally. They're not going to recover that quickly. And sadly, yeah, we are, we are going to see some of these airlines disappearing. But as ever, you know, one door, one door closes and another door opens. So um, whilst I've been probably an early proponent of saying that I don't think people are realizing 
just how hard the econ how much economic damage will be done by this and how long this is going to last. I mean, jobs being lost isn't something that works itself out very quickly. And the, the numbers that are coming through, I, I will not use the word unprecedented, but we've never seen them before. Just never, ever seen them before on record. Um, so you can't say, oh, this is like 2008, or this is like anything else, because it's not. Um, Michael, you want to say something? I, I'm in agreement. You know, we just haven't seen anything like this before. And, um, you know, I think uh, you're going to see airlines survive where government's really stepped in to take a share um, or they're seeking private. But I think, you know, I, yeah, I think um, we're going to see a lot of, a lot of casualties and, you know, and also um, in the hotel industry, the bar, restaurant, you know, we've already seen some really dear your friends already fold up their businesses um, already, you know, and um, it's uh, it's going to be an incredibly challenging time when we're reopening. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, I think that uh, I think the old adage is if you want to become a mil millionaire, the best way to become a millionaire is to be a billionaire and set up an airline. That's that's the old adage on that one. <laughs> uh, Jimmy, what, what do you think? people will want i talked about meaningful travel what do you think people are going to be wanting it's about experience i suppose it's not going off i suppose in your neck of the woods going off to to, to benny dorm for a week or something like that and i don't want to be sort of uh, yeah the snob about it there's some interesting tribes and species but um <laughs> i think we'd probably go further afield for that it very much is you know, really absorbing yourself in in a culture but an ecosystem and and making the most of it and I think where we really excel is multi-generational trips with lots of different interests um, across the generations and levels of activity and that could be from a tribal immersion through to a, a wildlife experience and the conservation piece and bringing all of that together and designing it is half the process of which the client loves. So they like to see it come together with the expertise and the different experts. And if that's bringing a marine biologist to teach them about um, the regeneration of the, the coral in the, in the Solomon Islands, or actually going into the highlands of Papua New Guinea and getting a full tribal experience and learning how they live off the ground, uh, those kind of experiences. But it doesn't have to be all in, in some remote areas as well. And I think, you know, certainly for the clients we're talking to for our domestic areas, you know, so many people don't understand what's in the British Isles, if I use just that perspective. And actually, the, the islands of you know, Scotland and the Outer Hebrides, and we're showing them pictures, and they're thinking we're showing them pictures of the Caribbean. Admittedly, it is on a sunny day, um, you know, and, we, and we wish for those days. But they are... You know, their minds are blown by what's there and integrating with um, a forager and you're going out and with a local fisherman and you're, you're catching your, your meal for the day and then bringing an amazing chef. You know, I'd love to work with Michael's chef. I was saying to him the other day, he's fantastic. Um, and yeah. you know, maybe nice. we get a partnership there, Michael, that actually bring the rosewood to the remote and, you know, and give them that experience and change the perspective. Um, and I think that there is something for that, actually, that you know, doesn't have to be in the norm of where you are. Actually, how can we take a little bit of the Rose River experience and move it somewhere else and enlighten the client and go, wow, I still had that amazing level of service, everything that it stands for, and that incredible chef. And then, but I went and helped catch that meal and I learned about the coastline and we took a rib or a speedboat down the down the beach um, and you're building it into more than a, a two-dimensional or three-dimensional experience. Uh, and Michael, this actually goes to a question from Clement Joseph, T talking about intangibles. I mean, do they go, go by the wayside as you have that uh, je ne sais quoi, if you like, which is really what makes you stand out from somebody else, perhaps? Do the intangibles go by the wayside? You mentioned earlier that some of these plans have been put on hold now, but you need them. You need to differentiate. Yeah, no, absolutely. You do. And you can't all of a sudden have this sterile environment uh, from a, um, you know, from an eclecticness from what the, what the offering of the hotel is. And we have a very strong identity, especially in our food and beverage, which of course is going to be super important for our local clientele. You know, if they're going into Scarf's Bar or Holbert and Dining Room, um, we don't want to remove that personality for sure. Um, and there's, we actually have some great things already lined up 
for when the opening is. We're going to pop up in the in the courtyard already lined up. Um, a new scarf spar concept in our cocktail menu. I mean, I think we're all going to want a cocktail at the end of this. So you know, and we're all we're all probably want a great pie in Holborn dining room. So. And we're actually, we've already had, we've always had a good educational piece at the hotel um, from master classes um, to our staff teaching you about, you know, the 500 gins we have or Callum and the pie making. We've already had those elements. And what we're looking at now as well is that our agents, our advisors and our guests know, you know, what you could add on to a London stay. You know, maybe it's our hotel in Paris with the Creon, especially if within quarantine, if we can do travel between both areas. And then outside of London, what can you do maybe in the Lake District or in the Cotswolds? So we're helping them kind of package that together as well. And, and Colin, again, this goes to a question from W. James, uh, talking about what do you do as a, uh, a charter broker, luxury travel provider? What do you do up a, a, above and beyond just the aircraft to make yourselves again provide that uh, that intangible thing well i mean one of the phrases that's been come up is it coming up is this you know controlled environment travel and this notion of you know almost traveling within a bubble um and it, this also speaks back to say for example if you've got anyone who's maybe higher risk at home in the family i, I think we're likely to see families traveling more together because you know what you're going to go maybe three generations of the family because you're all living together you feel safe together uh, and that notion of getting in a car a van arriving at a if you're flying privately i mean if you're fortunate enough to do that you're you're, you're, you're arriving in a, a private terminal which is normally a very small environment the car will pull up the family can move in there'll be no one else within that very small lounge environment there'll be you know a, a, a very discreet you know, security check immigration check and of course, you know, this person hasn't just been handling 4,000 passports before you. Um, I think it's quite, I think once you're on board, again, it's your environment. And to be honest, I mean, I was about to say anything goes, but it, it's, we, some people just want to get there and fly. But we, we actually encourage our clients. We say, look, you know, it's, it, it's your aircraft. What do you like? And it could literally be down to, you know, type of cushions they like, the sort of uh, pajamas they want. Um, do you want to travel with your dogs? Uh, not advocating it, but do you smoke? I mean, we've got clients who specifically travel privately so they can smoke. Do you want to bring your puppies on board, dogs on board? Do you board? want to name him? Uh, I'd love to, because you'd all know him. <laughs> <laughs> you were, though. Um, but um, so, so I, I think it's likely, and it's really, I'm not even making this up, literally just before this webinar started, we had an inquiry, uh, I think it's flying from intra-Europe, it's like from uh, Lisbon to, to Italy, and looking at the passenger list, it looks like that's three families, and that's the other thing. It might be a case of in families will hang out with other families and just try and reduce that sort of uh, uh, the contact they're having with, with strangers. Um, so I think it's likely we'll see families traveling together, uh, groups, friends traveling together, um, and again, certainly when, when you're on board, it's whatever you want. If you want to bring board games on board, you know, you want to put a movie on, you, you, know, you sleep when you want, you dim the, the cabin lights when you want. Um, and, and I think that all sounds very luxurious. And I, I've got an interesting feeling that uh, none of us have crystal balls, but say for my industry, you know, the, the private travel, it's got a very luxurious reputation. And, and for sure, some people fly and it's about luxury. It's, it's about because they can. Sometimes that's not the case, though. Um, and interestingly, we, we talk about things like uh, COVID and some of the people that are at risk with that are, say, people with respiratory problems. Um, so if you had COPD or something like that, now getting on an aircraft for someone like that, any aircraft, can be quite unpleasant. But one thing people don't realise about a private jet, especially the, the newer, more high-end ones, you can actually pressurise that cabin significantly more than you would normally with a, a commercial airline. So you would have someone, for example, that hasn't got great lungs, but they would be able to fly privately. They would not be able to get on a commercial aircraft. So I, I've got a feeling that we will, you know, possibly lose some business travellers or they'll travel less frequently. I think we will see a slight shift with the business travel. Some of it will be perhaps older people or higher risk people travelling where traditionally they might fly just business class but the company wants to protect them, wants to ensure that they're, they're safe. So they might start flying business. And again, I, 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 sort of, I think we will see families allocating a bit more budget uh, for that 
for that controlled environment travel so that they just feel safe during that journey um, and uh, yeah I, I think I think that's I think that's the shift that we're going to see in our business I, I guess that will quite that probably in some ways mirror the general travel population as well for, for commercial travel uh, talking to Alan Joyce he was saying that in some cases it's, a, it's going to become so much more expensive to travel at least in the medium term if you've got a let's say a, a, a 787 and you've got 40 people on board and that's all you can really carry uh, that's going to inflate costs hugely so that's going to be a boon for your business because it would provide an alternative effectively and now, now Colin the, the thing is do you see fares going up uh, on in airlines uh, Jimmy Michael what about you know as you talked about the, the uh, average room rates as well tell us all about that but let, let's start with you Michael on that yeah I mean I, th I mean, f from the airline executives we've been speaking with um, and understanding what they're doing um, with their fleet, I mean, I, yeah, I think we're going to see those uh, fares go up for sure. And um, we're going to see um, people utilizing more services uh, to get them through the airport safely um, and then from, from uh, transportation to the property. Um, and I really do uh, foresee hotels where they can in markets um, holding the rate. I don't see our rates going up, but I see our rates being held. And I've already started to see that um, in cities such as Paris that have just sort of beginning to reopen. You know, the average room um, in Paris right now is well over a thousand euros in, on the luxury end. So. I, yeah, I, I think our rates are going to stay where they should stay. Um, and I think in luxury, rates should stay where they are. Um, uh, but in airlines, yeah, I think, I think for sure there's going to be a steep increase. For some reason, a lot of people feel, I think, that there, all of a sudden there's going to be a big sale to try and get people back on the plane. But I don't, I don't particularly foresee that. Jimmy, tell me about your business and uh, tell me about how you see it evolving. I'm going to ask this question to both of you. I know we've touched on it, but if you can try and just wrap everything together as we close up. Yeah, I think, you know, very much echoing Michael's words there on the, on the airline side. I think for us, it's about the operators we use in countries um, and if they're surviving and probably um, a minimalized uh, effect there of who you can actually go to. Um, to, to build things out. So a lot of these companies don't have huge cash flows um, or the, the ability to call on, on governments and certainly in more remote regions, um, governments just aren't able to prop up industries in the same way that we are here in the Western world. So that will absolutely have an effect. But ultimately for, for our client, I don't think a huge amount will change on, on the cost basis of, of operating of how, how we build our trips. Um, certainly in the, in the super yacht market, there's not any conversations going on about how charter prices are going to increase. Demand was always um, outstripping supply, really. Um, they've been massively hit this year. Uh, but if you look at Antarctica, the, the, the biggest problem there has always been a, a lack of supply of vessels going down there for the clientele. Um, so I, I think we're, we're slightly protected on that front, luckily. Um, Ultimately, as well, there's going to be a lot of clients who won't have spent a huge amount over the last three months. Um, and a number of them we, we've been speaking with said, I've been boxed up, I've been at home, I can't do anything. And you know, they're fortunate their fortunes haven't changed at all. Um, and they've now got excess money to spend on trips when they want to go away. And it goes back right to that point at the very beginning of the conversation. You know, People want to get away, and I think Michael said it. You know, their, their clientele want to come and visit Rosewood, and the same with us. They want to get travelling. Yep, uh, Jimmy and Colin and, 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 and Michael answer that sort of question as well. But isn't it really also about making that person feel special, making that person feel confident that they're safe and they're secure there, Colin? And yeah. um, I think. We're, we're putting in, in measures in place now and we're about to make some announcements in the coming week about how we actually address all of that at every single stage of the process. So it's a full turnkey uh, bespoke experience. 
from the planning, and I talked about that military side, to the actual execution of each of the trips. And some partnerships that we're, we're announced in the next week or so will reassure, build reassurance in there and make the clientele feel incredibly special. Uh, and then measures that Colin was saying, you know, cleaning and, and Michael with the, with the hotels, you know, working together with partners across the world to ensure that it's a seamless interaction and you know, the, the client does feel like they're, they're absolutely protected and paramount to it all is is uh, health and safety right uh, very very quickly um colin briefly yeah. your thoughts on that question and i'm going to ask michael if you just be very brief and i've got one more question for you after that well, well, very quickly on the airfares i mean airfares are going up for sure costs are going up the airlines will pass those costs on but we should keep them honest and remind them that oil price has collapsed and one of the big components of the operation of, a, of, a, of an aircraft is is the fuel so the, the only saving grace in this is with the aircraft fuel prices coming down that will hopefully do something to offset the price increases probably by the, the cleaning security etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and I don't really see there's a lot of talk about um, leaving the middle seat empty I'm not convinced that commercial airliners can be viable by doing that I think it's much more likely we might we might see perspex screens between people I can even imagine a floor to ceiling um, screen in between chairs, in between seats. Uh, an aircraft you know, do generally ventilate you know, from the ceiling down to the floor with HEPA filters on my head. I mean, the aircraft, aircraft replace the air probably every two and a half minutes that people don't realize this, and they have HEPA filters. These are you know, hospital grade filters on the aircraft. So in, also speaking, Richard, you said making them feel special, yeah, but making them feel safe moment is the most important thing so i think there'll be some education as well to explain to people that this is how the aircraft were to start with and the air was actually not, not as bad as many people think and of course these are the measures we put on top of that michael very very briefly please yep um yeah i mean i think back to the point where i think it's all going to be about the communication with the client ahead of the stay and reassuring them and not waiting for them to pose questions or concerns to us. That pre-arrival is going to be so critically important so they understand. And then for me uh, and for us at the property, it's also understanding um, and, um, and speaking with, on a continual basis, um, our uh, suppliers who basically are within the transportation of that client. So whether it is um, from private travel um, or commercial air travel at the airport, you know, we've always been working with the airports directly. Um, and, you know, I think that's going to be critical. Um, and, you know, coming up with, you know, so, so some of our staff members can be at the airport to meet our clients, our drivers, it's our cars, what are the protocols, um, that whole journey um being um just like the most secure sanitized um safe way and making sure the client understands all of the precautions we're doing in advance um so they're assured i'm gonna wrap things up but i want just in 15 seconds if i'm talking to you this time next year what will it feel like give me one prediction guys um and i'm gonna put Colin on the spot with this one to begin with. So very quickly, Colin, 15 seconds. Time next year, I think the feeling will be that we've probably got to the top of the hill and we're coming down the other side. I, th I think there'll be a genuine broad feeling that things are improving and not getting worse. They might be coming off of a low base, but I, I think this time next year, sentiment will be a lot more optimistic. Jimmy. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I think you'll find there'll be hotspots in the world that people will travel to and they will become you know, the go-to places as more and more places open up. Um, but hopefully everyone will, will be starting to think in a more positive manner and looking back on this going, wow. And also, what have we learned? Michael. Well, I hope we're in a, obviously a far better place. I hope the issues with mass tourism in certain areas have dissipated. We're, we're seeing new and exploring new places and that London's booming and that we feel that, you know, there's the light at the end of the tunnel is brighter and it's shining. Um, but look, we all want to travel. We all want to travel tomorrow. And um, I, yeah, hopefully the world is an open place by the time 
you know, we're, we're sort of eight months away from here. Michael, Jimmy, thank you very much. I'll leave the final few words to Colin. Colin. Risha, thank you very, very much. Um, Yes, so yeah, Jimmy, Michael, thank you very, very much for joining us this evening. It's been, been quite insightful. Um, thank you also very much for, to everyone who's actually joined us live on the webinar. And sorry we couldn't get to all of those questions. There was a, a lot of engagement there, um, but hopefully we uh, uh, covered most of them um, and hopefully found this fairly insightful. So this was the second of, of three fireside chats. So uh, hopefully you can join us next week, uh, same time, same place. And next week we will be talking about luxury. So thank you once again and uh, have a very good rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.